This is a picture of Captain James Lovell. He was an American astronaut who was intended to land on the moon, but there was an explosion on board. They were very lucky to get back alive. Now, I met him and I've blown the story slightly because I told you the end first. But <laughs> however, I was in New York in the Regency Hotel uh, because we were there to see the first showing of um, Space 1999 on television. And I came down to breakfast and the waiter came over and said, I'm terribly sorry, sir, but we haven't got a table. But if you don't mind waiting just here, uh, I'll have a table for you for a short price. So I stood there waiting, and a very good looking, tall American guy came in and stood next to me. And the waiter came rushing over and said, If you two gentlemen don't mind sitting together, I can find a table for you right away. So we sat down together. And then we had this conversation like, you're British. <laughs> yes, I'm, I am British. And you're American. Yeah, I'm American. You know, this is how it started. And then it inevitably it came on to uh, what, what's your line of country? And I said, uh, I'm a filmmaker. What do you make? I said, I'm over here for the first screening of uh, Space 1999. He said, oh, I've seen it. So he said, uh, I thought the hardware was very good. So I said, oh, that's, that's nice to know. He said, um, are you interested in space? I said, well, I am, actually. I then told him <clears throat> that I'd been to Cape Canaveral, where, where they launched the rockets, and that I've actually stood in the flame pit of the moon rockets. And he seemed to be very interested, so I continued. You know, I told him how the astronaut escape system worked. I told him about the VAB building, where they um, assemble the rockets how the door in the, in the VAB building is 370 feet high, so, you know, and how clouds form and stuff. And he was enormously interested. So he then said, um, he said, actually, I did a spell in Cape Canaveral myself. I said, oh, did you? I said, did you see a launch? He said, no, I didn't see a launch, uh, but I was there during two launches. And I thought, oh, he must be a computer operator, and he was down in a basement somewhere. Anyway, we finished our breakfast and uh, I gave him my card and he said, I'll oh, thank you very much. And he gave me his card and I looked. It was Captain James Lovell. And I was so shocked. I said, you bastard. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, he said, I was uh, there during two launches, but I didn't see them. I said, no, because he was sitting around on top of his giant firework. Now, I, people ask me for Autographs. I, I don't know why, because I, I, I don't ask anybody for an autograph. But with him, for the first time in my life, I said, could I have an autograph? And he sent me this letter. So I'll just read very quickly. It says, to Mr. Anderson, many thanks for your nice letter. I apologize for not telling you earlier in our conversation at breakfast that my background was with the space program. Enclosed is the only space with Asian photo I have at the present time. I hope it is satisfactory. I probably failed to tell you in New York that although I have been to the moon twice, I never had the privilege of actually landing. My first flight was Apollo 8, man's first venture to the moon. On that flight, we merely orbited the moon for 20 hours on Christmas Eve, 1968. My second flight was Apollo 13 which was to have landed at a place called Fra Muro. I'm sure I got that right. Two days after liftoff on that flight, about 200,000 miles from our, our oxygen tank exploded, and we spent the rest of the flight trying to figure out how to make a successful return voyage. Let me say again, I enjoyed Space 1999 series. A lot of hardware vehicles have an authentic look to them, I suspect that your program has received a lot of favourable comment and should be around for a long time. When I'm viewing the series, I get twinges of nostalgia. Some scenes bring back old memories and I sometimes wish I could join the group on Moonbase Alpha. In any event, if you ever need a consultant, let me know. Is that possibly your best critique ever? <laughs> um, what do 
to say. Uh, <laughs> well, it's from the guy that's actually been in the spaceship. To, to say that he really thought that it was very lifelike is pretty well, incredible. So it's not as good as the one that my son gave me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is absolutely... An, an no, it, it, it is really great. Fascinating. This is, as you can see, a model of Fab One, Lady Penelope's Rolls Royce. It is not a child's toy. This is an adult model to be displayed in people's homes, offices, or wherever. Um, it's covered to protect it, but also you can see the two old-fashioned aerials that it's got. Um, if it goes to a child, I always have those two removed, because if a child looks forward to see the uh, park and the child could lose an eye. But, <clears throat> of course, here it's quite safe. It's a beautiful model. And this, incidentally, is solid silver. And there's only one other in the world like it. I don't know where it is. I know there's another one somewhere. <laughs> but Samson, you were quite at the forefront, really, of, of making this kind of memorabilia available to fans of the show, weren't you? At the time we made Thunderbirds, we had um, a record company, publishing company, a toy company, and a merchandising company. And we did, in fact, do our own merchandising. But as the years went by, merchandising companies sprang up all over the place that were specialised and now we let either the broadcaster or a merchandising company do the work for us. But I mean that's quite a big accolade really isn't it to have the, that forethought because now obviously every film comes out with a happy meal full of uh, little models and all the rest of it. I, I, I'm sure we were one of the first to merchandise a television series. And now, if, if this is going to, because these do pop up in auction, are you surprised by how much this type of thing will fetch at auction? Well, this is a set price because <clears throat> I think there were 1,500 of these made. It's a limited edition. Uh, these uh, sell at around about £350. But I'm president of the local air ambulance, and last night I went to a fundraising do and I took along one of these models to be auctioned. So I, it was, these are £350 to buy. Last night it was bought for £1,100. <laughs> I bet they're very pleased they got you on the board. <laughs> Can I just um, have a look at this picture up here? This is a life-size <laughs> version of this, isn't it? Yes, it is. And this particular one, um, I had made, I mean, you know, it used to be lovely times in the 60s. I had this made um, for no other reason than for promotion. And it was driven around the country with um, a lady who looked something like Lady Penelope sitting in the back. And of course it caused a huge amount of interest. And now it's in a motor museum in Keswick. Uh, stars, star cars, or cars for the stars, I can't remember that. But anyway, it's still on show. Uh, interestingly, uh, I've got a fan club called Fanderson. <laughs> fan club, Fanderson, get it? Um, and one of the fans has just built a better model, full size than that. This isn't drivable, you know, it's just not good enough to go on the road. The new one is drivable, and when I saw him a couple of weeks ago, he said that he was driving to London along the motorway and cars were overtaking him with people leaning out the windows taking pictures and then he was held up by the police <laughs> and so he pulled in and the policeman said oh lady Penelope from Charles Royce can I have a look yes he can have a look oh very oh, it's very good okay off you go uh, the fact is he didn't have a legal number plate on <laughs> <laughs> but they still allowed him to go. Uh, and then I thought about it. Well, if there was a car crash and somebody said it was Lady Penelope's Rolls Royce, I don't think they'd be too worried if they didn't have a registration on it, you know. <laughs> I think they'd find them. Um, is it true that Lou Grade gave you a Rolls Royce because he was so thrilled with the success of them that Yes, one morning I got in and he was all of a doodah and he said, oh, quick, uh, come with me. And I went, we went down to the basement where 
all the posh cars are kept, but then they all had cages to protect them. And there was a brand new Rolls Royce. And he said, what's your way to chuck the key and I caught it. He said, that's yours. And on another occasion, when we had the um, premiere of Thunderbirds Arco, the feature film, there were, I, I, God knows how many photographers, but I, I was almost blinded by the flashlights. And while the photographs were being taken, he leaned over and said, <coughs> he said, you know, you know uh, that you stayed in that house in Portugal that belonged to my brother, Leslie Grade. I said, yes. He said, it's yours. And then the snappers got you going, <laughs> like that. <laughs> no, I'm very good at coming, actually. <laughs> but, 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 you know, that's exactly how business is today, isn't it? Right. Is this car here? Um, yeah, this car is in the new Captain Scarlet. And it, it has wings which open. And when I say it can fly, it can only fly high enough to overtake a traffic jam, for example, and land the other side and continue the journey. Um, these were models that we made of the main characters. Uh, this is uh, Captain Scarlet. Um, and these were scanned onto computer by, la by laser, uh, uh, so that we got the likenesses accurate. But as we went on with the series, in fact, we found that we could build the characters on the computer. And so we didn't make any more models, so we just built on the computer directly by sculptors that could operate a computer. With the original Captain Scarlet, was it very difficult? Because they were, how big were the Captain Scarlet the puppets? puppets? Yeah, because the, uh, they were bigger, weren't they? Than but, what no, you were no, 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 they weren't. No, they, they were about 18 inches high, roughly one third life size. But uh, when you say they were bigger, the, the, what made them look bigger was that because the early puppets had the mouth mechanism inside the head, the head had to be bigger than it should, it would have normally been. Right. And so all the early puppets were bigger. But when we made Captain Scarlet, uh, electrical components were now much smaller mm -hmm. and of course there were all kinds of devices that enabled us to make the gubbins very small and we then instead of having the stuff in the head we had it in the puppet's chest and there was a bow and cable that went up through the neck that used to operate the mouth automatically so it's still an automatic system but the heads of the puppets were in proportion with the body. This is uh, an, another vehicle uh, from the um, new Captain Scarlet series. And they're along here, made by the same company that made that Rolls Royce. Uh, there are smaller models. This one is Fireball XL5. This one came from UFO. The supercar was filmed in colour. In fact, it was the first television series in this country to be filmed in colour. But it was kind of a ridiculous situation because we filmed it in colour and then for this country we had to translate it in black and white. So the show was screened here in black and white because we didn't have colour television. In America, the colour print went to America and they saw it in colour. But the interesting thing was that all the kids in this country saw the show in black and white. And then the years rolled by and we started with our own colour system here. And then they released Supercar in colour. And everybody was saying, look, they've coloured it. But of course they didn't realise that it was shocking colour in the first place. Because wasn't Stingray the first series ever to be shown in colour? Is that correct? Uh, it would have been the first television series to be shown in colour, yes. What's this one? Again, <coughs> these models are made by the same people that made Penelope's Rolls Royce. Uh, this is from UFO and it's the submarine. But the trick with this one, it carries our, its own aircraft and that takes off and bursts through the water and flies. So 
they're, they're really um, beautiful models. This is very, very heavy, you know. Not the sort of thing you normally buy in the shop. Um, and this one is uh, Stingray. In wonderful technicolor. In wonderful technicolor. <laughs> and finally, <coughs> UFO with one of the interceptors. So, uh, all of these are limited editions, and you know, uh, anybody who's interested with the right to find the studio, so I'll tell them where to get them from. <laughs> you mentioned earlier about um, America and, and filming stuff for an American, with an American audience in mind. Was it always the view that you wanted to branch out in the States? Oh, every filmmaker wants to get into the States. Um, I mean, <clears throat> America equals half the entire world. So the take in America is 50% of the world takes up. America is a terribly important territory. So the only thing is in all my shows, I've never ever had so-called transatlantic accents. You know, we either use British accents, which are acceptable in America, for example, or uh, touch of Irish is all right, touch of Scots is all right. Um, but never sort of an effort to get an English person to speak like an American. We sometimes use Canadians to take American parts, or we would have English people whose style was acceptable in the States. Uh, I mean, there are many, many British stars that are well known in America. What, what doesn't go down well in America is in Cockney. Oh, wow. First of all, they well. First of all, they think these people are Australian, <laughs> so, so and, and equally, uh, sort of fretfully posh stuff doesn't go down there unless it's a comedy thing like Lady Penelope. Lady Penelope, the original posh totty. Uh, yeah, you could say that. <laughs> In actual fact, um, there was a very definite reason why we introduced these two, and that was because the show had to be for, you know, if it, if, if it was going to be realistic, one had to acknowledge that the only people that could have built those aircraft and, and rockets were the Americans. And I think if we had said that um, uh, the, this uh, Thunderbird 2 was launched from Scunthorpe, I really don't think people would accept that. So we, would, we, we had to, because of the story content, we had to make it set as an American uh, operation. Now, having done that, I felt that we needed to have British representation in the key characters. And so Penelope was born, and her crooked driver, who was the next safe cracker, that these two were set up. And they were set up on the basis that we, the British, can laugh at ourselves. And the Americans, being Americans, love to laugh at us, you know, limeys and all that sort of thing. So therefore, it was an ideal way of putting in a British uh, component uh, without sort of spoiling the believability. Is it weird to think that some men might have fancied her? <laughs> Did she get fan mail? I think there were probably several million men who fancied her. There are probably a few who fancy Parker. <laughs> well, you know, it seems to be a fashion these days, doesn't it? <laughs> Did they get fan mail though? I know that sounds like a really bizarre question, but you know kids believe characters and all the rest of it. They're so obviously puppets, but was there a lot of fan mail and all the rest of it at the time? Oddly enough, as I think about it, uh, no, they, they didn't use to like the characters. They were like to me about the characters, but the characters themselves, they, they didn't, didn't write to the, character, the, to the characters now. And they're still writing to you by Fanderson, aren't they? I mean, it's yes. still, they're still all out there. Yes. When you go to conventions and things, when you, when you meet the fans, I mean, how do they present themselves to you? Do they dress up or anything like that? See, a lot of these questions are difficult to answer because when Fanderson was first formed, that's 25 years ago, they were kids, just a group of kids. 
<clears throat> and so yes, they used to dress up. And there was one very, very fat girl, enormous she was, used to blacken her face with charcoal, don't ask me why, and swan in and say, I'm Lady Penelope. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I said, oh, that's not very good. And she still does the same thing now. She's old, but still it's just as big. <laughs> but she doesn't wear the black makeup anymore. Um, and then, of course, uh, as the years uh, went by, uh, the fans were getting older. And the sort of thing that used to happen to me, uh, I, I used to be terrified of uh, cameras, movie cameras. I, I, used to, I used to be so shy I can't tell you and I still don't like live broadcasts for the same reason but um, I find that as the years went by a camera crew would come in and they would all be po-faced and they'd set up the camera and uh, I was told to stand there and off we went and my nerves were, were just tearing me apart and I struggled through because I was afraid of the camera crew and then the director said, OK, cut, that's fine. And then the camera crew would come over and say, come out with your autograph. And I used to think, oh, I wish we had done that before we started. <laughs> um, so, yes, as, as things uh, have progressed, the, of course, the, the fans have got older. And um, the last convention they had was uh, the 25th anniversary of the club. And there were 400 people there, and the tickets were £100 each. This is quite incredible. Can you try and tell me what's going on here? Well, f first of all, um, when I made Torture the Battery Boy, which was the second series I made, a young lad by the name of Derek Meddings, who was working for a special effects company, used to come into our little studio at night to paint the backings and he used to paint the clouds and, and the clouds were sort of like little loops of white, you know, they weren't realistic. And after a while um, I said to him, would you join us, which he did. So we then had our own special effects department and one of the things we specialised in was explosions and I got known, known for the explosions but they were all staged in, inside the studio and it, it could be pretty terrifying with the noise of those things going off. But Derek grew with the company and became, whilst he was with me, one of the most successful special effects men in the business, filming miniatures, because that's what we were always using. And when we filmed, uh, I think it was Stingray, it must have been Stingray, um, he drew this for me. This is the original drawing. So here's Fireball XL5 on the roof. You can see the company was called AP Films at that time. Because we were trying to sell to America, it became obvious to everybody. So in the drawing, the American flag is on top of the British and it's much bigger as well. This is me, Gulf. I used to smoke Havana cigars, and uh, there's a cigar <laughs> on the end there. This was Sylvia, who I used to be married to. Um, this was a lovely man who started life as a cleaner, um, Arthur Cripps. And I one day said to him, what trade did you normally have? And he said, I was an upholsterer. And he finished then, he finished up making all our miniature furniture, even sort of buttoning, you know, things like settees and so on. And he finally was in charge of the props department. Here's a man with a, a very, very large cup. That was John Reed, one of the partners, and he was forever drinking tea. So that's, that's that one. That was somebody under here working on the rostrum that we're sitting on. This little thing here is the front of my Jaguar, which I had at the time. And then if you look at closely at the headlamps, you can see that the fish, that there are fish in there. Our puppeteers always worked overhead, so they weren't in the way of, of uh, the background. And normally we would be operating inside with a stage underneath and the puppets on the stage. But here, because it was a, a marine picture, they're standing over a pond and uh, wearing flippers and, and so on. 
Up here was is the late Barry Gray, who did all the wonderful music for the, all the shows, and uh, he's playing a harp. In reality, now he is up there playing a harp. Interestingly enough, just last week, a drawing of Derek Meddings, who went on to, to uh, before he died, he, he used to do the special effects on James Bond. But um, last week, uh, a drawing of Thunderbird 3, uh, just, just a sketch, sold uh, at an auction for £6,000. So, if anybody's watching here or playing this on a DVD, can we start bidding at uh, 15000 <laughs> I don't think you'd lose that. Moving on to the new Captain Scarlet here, do you ever see yourself in any of these characters that you make? I don't think any of the characters I've created are good enough for me to, <laughs> to, to say that, that that's what I want to be. But uh, I'll, I'll try and create something really good and say that's what I, I would like to be. I'll let you know when it's ready. <laughs> how about this uh, all new Captain Scarlet? How was it moving into the CGI and doing that all of that? Um, we, we had uh, about 200 computers uh, in use. Took two years to make, and uh, of course it was wonderful, really, because having worked with puppets, I was able to bring them to life, and they could walk and do everything you and I can do. So it was uh, a great achievement. And I, you know, I'm not saying this on my behalf. I mean, there was a huge crew involved, and of course they all were responsible for this uh, magnificent series. This picture here. Um, our designer uh, put together uh, with Scarlet and Blue and Colonel White and Destiny Angel and this is an Angel aircraft. Uh, it's printed on simulated canvas so it looks like a painting. I tell people this is a letter from the Queen but in fact it's uh, when I was awarded the MBE uh, for services to the British Film Ministry. Yeah. And I've got my gong, which I have at home, and this is the thing that comes with it. Um, I was amazed how small the Queen was, I have to say. Um, I'm not a royalist, but you know, I was really quite scared. And she said, what do you do? And I said, uh, I, I, I make films for children, uh, which is very nice and she said yes it would be very nice that was it that was it but, uh, you remember, expect something so much more don't I you i couldn't think of anything more <laughs> <laughs> how, did, how did you react when you knew that you'd been awarded the mba well we, uh, my, my wife got the notification she found me and i was very excited you know that's uh that's uh isn't it <laughs> next one night We'll wait for that one. Should we move on to these? Yeah. In 1967, um, a huge oil tanker called the Tory Camden um, ran aground and split in two. And the thousands of gallons of oil were pouring out. And the RAF finally um, bombed it to blow it apart so that it wouldn't constantly be draining out for months on end. And this appeared in the Evening Standard uh, by a famous cartoonist, Jack, and of course it's entitled Who Called in International Rescue because it's got Thunderbird 2 and Thunderbird 1 flying there. So it was very proud um, to, for me to get the original of that. This is a more recent one by um, a guy called Springs who does excellent work. Um, he's got this very distinctive style. As you can see, this is um, he, should, he who must be obeyed. Uh, <laughs> George Bush. <laughs> oh, this is one. Yes, yes. I often wondered who he was. This is uh, our, our version of George Bush, of course, Tony Blair. Uh, that's the guy from the Kremlin, and that one mystifies me. You should have been there. And so when did you get this? Who sent you this? It's fabulous. Well, it, it springs as the yeah. name of the... Oh, that's the name he uses. And 
that says, I read it to Jerry Anderson with admiration. Well, John Springs, 2005. Which program is this model from? Uh, this is from the Space 1999 series, and it's called the Eagle Transporter. Uh, the clever thing about this design, which was designed by Brian Johnson, who was at that time our special effects director, is that it's not streamlined, as you can see. That couldn't possibly fly in our Earth's atmosphere because it was just wouldn't have any lift. And if it went too fast, it would get hot and burn up. Um, and people at first couldn't accept this design, but of course, in space where there's no air, damn nearly a vacuum, that needs to be as light as possible and uh, you can have this sort of construction. But this is a beautiful model. Again, it's a, a, it's a limited edition and uh, it, it's absolutely correct to the last night bolt of the model that we use in the series. Would you say um, a, a personality trait, which I think you probably have to have in your profession, is perfectionism? Would you say that, that that's correct? <clears throat> well, I, I'm, I'm very anxious to get um, things right. I don't think it's for me to sound perfectionist, I leave that to others, but uh, I, I certainly try very, very hard to make what is on the screen look believable. Uh, and I think it just makes it more enjoyable if people believe what they're watching, even if it's only for the time of the show. You know, they can criticise it afterwards, but then you know, the job is done. Mr. Anson, thank you very much for showing the show. It really was my